Praise God. All right. So, let's see here. You going to put me on number two? We uh so we, we we covered quite a bit last week we we really laid a foundation for Daniel chapter nine a couple of things just to remind you because it was a lot of information and some people are like at different levels of understanding Daniel and Daniel chapter nine and end time stuff so sometimes repeating certain concepts maybe it'll help it to sink in really really deep in our hearts and minds. Um, so we really covered the first part of the chapter that gives the context of how all this information came about. If you'll remember, Daniel was praying. It was nearing the end of the 70 years that had already been prophesied by the prophet Jeremiah because of Israel's uh, disobedience in the past. Really with uh, going after the strange gods that started with King Solomon. I don't want to cover that whole thing all over again, but it started a process. Solomon making decisions led Israel astray. And like I read to you, kind of we gave some examples. King after king, many of the kings went after those false gods. They allowed idolatry into the land. And God would send the prophets, right? During the time of the kings, God would send the prophets to warn them to turn. Um, and yet the people would not. And so ultimately, that's what ended up happening is the beginning of Daniel where Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, takes the city. And he brings those the Hebrew boys back and he brings the nation under captivity. And then as we also learn in the book of Daniel... There's a succession of empires or kingdoms that take place that Daniel prophesied that the, the empire or the nation of Babylon ends up being defeated by the Medo-Persian Empire. Persia is modern day Iran. And then after that, Alexander the Great, we'll, we'll talk about that some more when we get into the last chapters. Um, and then after Alexander the Great came the Roman Empire. And then one of the things that we've discussed on more than one occasion is that the kingdom of the antichrist and i think these things are important if you want to understand end time events i gotta be honest with you not everybody is that in, is always interested in, in end time events the people that are really really are i know that when i got saved the first book i read was the book of revelation um but but not everybody feels that way so if you don't really care that much about end time events then it's kind of hard to get real excited or stay stay focused. But um, hopefully, you know, it's important for us to know. I can tell you that the, these concepts are very important. So, so the, Ro the the kingdom of Antichrist, many scholars believe, and we have evidence in the Bible that shows that, will be part of a revitalized Roman Empire. Whenever we go to Revelation 17 and 18, and it talks about the beast, the seven-headed beast with the ten crowns um, that represents ten, ten kings and that they end up giving their power over to the Antichrist, that, that that kingdom of the Antichrist is coming from, and this is part of the, the scripture that we're going to get that from in, in Daniel 9 tonight, the passage that we'll cover, is going to come from, is going to describe that, that the kingdom of antichrist comes from a revitalized roman empire or comes out of the roman empire or whether it's geo i don't have all the answers for you to be honest with you is it geographical in nature where where that's where it starts because listen i do know this because i did i did some study in the past whenever i was studying this many many years ago that the that the, if and I could be speaking wrong, but from what I remember, the European Union started with the Treaty of Rome, and 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 one person that I read and I had a hard time completely verifying it, so I, I'm always honest with you whenever I can and when I can't. That the Treaty of Rome supposedly started with ten nations, and then sometimes when you go to look at it, you can find some stuff that verifies that, some stuff that that doesn't agree with that. And so I don't really have all the answers, but what I, I do believe that the kingdom of Antichrist, I do believe the spirit of Antichrist is on the earth today. Yeah. And, I, and I will tell you this real quick. I didn't plan on saying all this, but whenever I began to study 
the, the concept of the occult world whenever I ended up writing that book that I wrote, I realized that the, that the kingdom of Antichrist is very spiritual in nature. It's not all, you know, many times, when, even whenever many people believe that when we talk about mystery Babylon, that the city of Babylon or the nation of Babylon has to be rebuilt like a literal Babylon. I personally don't believe that. I believe that mystery Babylon is something that started, it's connected to mystery religions. And the Bible, I think, is clear on that. But many times, I think our eyes are closed to that kind of thing. So if this Roman Empire is a revitalized ge a ge place of geography, or if it's, if it's a spiritual thing connected to the somehow the religion of Rome, I'm just going to be real with you. Somehow I believe, and I'm just going to say it, somehow I believe the religion of Rome, and you can fill in the blanks if you want, is interconnected. We've already tried to show pictures on the screen of the, of the colors that right in the Vatican and, and, and the fact that she's drinking a cup. I'm not trying to say that the Catholic religion is Mystery Babylon. That's not what I'm trying to say, but it's all integrated and all part of that. I know that that probably causes people to throw a fit if they're watching video and it's the first time and they're not used to all of that. But reality of it is, is that all you got to do is just a little bit of research. Okay. And you find that this whole thing with the halos is interconnected to the sun disc and the worship of the sun god. And that the old monks, when they wear that thing on their head called a tonsure, all that's connected to the worship of the sun god. The prayer beads. Babylonian prayer beads like you can google it right now I could google it right now and I can show I mean this stuff's been in existence long before okay if you do the research on where I didn't plan on getting in all this but but the, but this is a big part the religion of Rome could be part of the answer of what I'm trying to say this this revitalized Roman Empire it might not be geographically although it is there geographic that's another thing somebody was talking the other day to me about how they had gone to the Vatican. And I said, did you notice that thing right there that every time that the Pope walks out on his balcony, what he looks at? And they were like, well, what are you talking? Because they were telling me how they went to the Vatican. And I'm like, well, you, you didn't notice that big old thing in the middle right there? It's an obelisk. It's an Egyptian obelisk. And it's right there when the Pope walks out on, the, on his balcony and he looks, this is what he sees. And, it, and what it, that is, is it, let's just call it what it is, dude. It's a, it's, a, it's a symbol of the male phallus because of the worship of these false religions that are interconnected to all this. Mason. This stuff has been around, dude, a long, long time. Then the Washington Monument is the same thing. Okay. I'm, uh, I'm not trying to get off on all this. I really didn't plan on doing this. Why on the dollar bill when it says, in God we trust, is there a pyramid with the capstone and the one eye on there, the eye of Horus that you can find on Egyptian petroglyphs, paintings on walls in Egypt that predate, that go back to ancient times with the eye of Horus on there. Why is all this stuff there? Why have we been blind to it? I can remember one time whenever I was studying all this stuff, walking in the lobby at the church in Franklin, like, oh my gosh, the pyramid with the eye. It's, it's like you're, we're blind to it. And, and I'm just telling you right now that I personally believe that that is really when we're talking about mystery Babylon and really this revitalized place where this kingdom of antichrist comes from i believe that all that in some ways interconnected i don't have all the details to be able to pinpoint it all out for you i'm just telling you that it's already here that's what i've been trying to that's really what i what more than anything what i want to get across the spirit of antichrist has been here there's been many antichrists there will be an antichrist and this this that's one of the things that the lord showed me a long time ago was, oh, you thought he was just going to show up one day and knock on the door and say, you, I'm here. No, that, that's what I was being blown away by when I was studying all this stuff. I was like, oh my gosh, this stuff's been in existence the whole time. That's why it's called Mystery Babylon. The Babylonian relig mystery religions, you, you, it's being done under the radar and the normal, I can't see it. 
Does that make sense what I'm trying to say? Most people can't see it, but then all of a sudden, when your eyes are open to it, you see this stuff everywhere. Like all these pyramids and all, I mean, just watch SpongeBob or watch, you know, it's everywhere. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> anyway, all right. <laughs> so I didn't plan on getting in all that, but we did. And so Daniel was praying because the 70 years were nearly up because the children of Israel had, had gone against, transgressed God. God allowed these, this kingdom, Babylon, Babylonian kingdom, to bring them under uh, bondage, right? And, and Jeremiah had prophesied that they would be in bondage for 70 years. And so Daniel goes to pray. And you remember what his prayer sounded like. He said, one of the things he said, and I just wanted to point this out because I was driving back towards uh, here. And I was thinking about some of the things that were in the prayer because because I kind of reviewed it again. And one thing that he kept saying was, to you belongs glory and honor. He was talking to the Lord. To us, confusion of faces. And what he was saying was because of, and he included himself in the sin of his, of his people, right? Daniel wasn't really there whenever they were doing it, but he includes himself. Lord, please forgive us for transgressing your ways. And he says, to you belongs glory and honor. To us, confusion of faces. Now, the idea behind that is, like a disorientation is, I guess, the way I would try to use that word, okay? Have you ever been, I mean, hopefully you haven't, but have you ever been knocked out? Or have you ever seen a person that was knocked out? Have you ever been hit real hard in the head or clipped on the chin and you, and you bit the dust and then you get back up? You're kind of disoriented at first. You're like, whoa, what? you know, you don't really know where you are. That's the picture that I get. Listen. It's never okay to allow ourselves to slip into sin because sin of any kind will drive us further away from God. But listen, the sin of false religion. See, that's really what Israel was involved with. They had allowed them. They, it, it resulted in lustful sin. It revolted, resulted in sexual sin. But they were interconnected to false gods. And so therefore, it caused even more confusion and confusion of face. They didn't, they didn't know. Can you imagine being so confused and disoriented that you don't know the way that God is wanting to lead and guide you as his people? And the reason that I felt like the Lord wanted to, was putting that on my heart is, is because we live in a pair. We li we're living in, I believe we're living in perilous times. Yeah. I really do believe that. I mean, I do believe it's going to get worse. That's just, and I mean, I'm not trying to be a negative, you know, whatever. But I believe it's going to get worse, okay? And and it's but it's already kind of bad out there. And and I'm telling you right now, don't be surprised, you know, whenever people start responding a certain way. Because listen, if you feel, if you already feel some of the stress that's going on in the world, I'm just saying. I mean, you love God and you're you're showing up. There's a whole lot of other places you could be on the Wednesday night. You love the Lord. You're in church, okay. And you're to some extent feeling the stress. I think you are. I mean, everybody can knows that there's crazy stuff going on in the world, mm -hmm. right? You think the other people ain't feeling it, and and they may not respond the same way that you would because of the fact that you're a believer and the Holy Spirit is moving on your heart to respond a certain way. So I'm just saying, like all this stuff is not going. It's it's just going to get worse, and people are going to start responding. In, you know, in a frustrated way, and it's just, you know, it's going to get worse and worse. More violence, you know. So, anyway, that's, that's kind of where Daniel was. And then in the middle of his prayer, the angel Gabriel comes and touches him. And, and this is where we are in chapter 23. I decided to read from the NASB because the way it's worded in the King James, to me, it's, it's very, like, wordy, and you kind of get lost in the Old English. So this is what the angel is saying to Daniel. He says, at the beginning of your supplications, or that's another word for prayers, the command was issued, in other words, to, to give an answer to Daniel's prayer. And I have come to tell you, for you are highly esteemed. So give heed to the message and gain understanding of the vision. Amen. God, Lord, give us understanding of the vision. Give us understanding of the message. 
Help us to understand what you desire for us to see in these days. Because listen, let me make this point again. Daniel's vision and this information that we're about to receive from Daniel was for the end days. Now, if you don't believe we're in the end days, that's that's okay. I'm not over here to try to beat people over the head to get them to be convinced. I'm convinced that we're, we're, we're in the end days. Well, I know we're in the end days because... When Jesus showed up, it started the end days. When the day of Pentecost, so and then the Apostle Paul said, "We're cl we're nearer now than when we when we were first when we first began talking about the end days." And you can see that that we're in the midst of perilous times. And so, again, I'm not trying to convince people, but I believe that we are, and that's what this vision was for. It was for the end days. Okay, so we need to be able to understand. So, again. Daniel says, 70 weeks have been decreed for your people and your holy city. Now, I made this comment real quickly last time, but I want to kind of bring it up again. If for people that for people that are very strong pre-tribulational believers, this is one of the scriptures that they will use to, to make that point. And I can see why they're saying that. But but this is because it says, look, seven, this is the position that they take. 70 weeks. Have been decreed for your for your people. Who's Daniel's people? Israel. Okay. And your holy city. So in the 70 weeks. Is situated the last seven years. You remember I made that point last time. That this is the only place that I have found in the Bible. That we find the last seven year period. Whether we call it the tribulation, whether we call it the last seven years, whether we call it the last week, whatever you want to call it, we're talking about that last seven years. This is the only place in the Bible that I know of that seven years are mentioned. Okay, again, I said it last time, but let's say it again. In the book of Revelation, 42 months, 1260 days, according to the Jewish cal lunar calendar, um, time, one year, times, two years, and half a time, three and a half years. That kind of information is repeated throughout the book of Revelation, but a seven year period is only mentioned in this Daniel. And this is where we get the idea for the last seven years, right here. So you, you all your life, most of y'all, y'all know, y'all looking at me like, okay, I'm bored preacher, but y'all know good and well. For the most part, y'all been talking about the last seven years. Seven year tribulation, but you didn't really necessarily know exactly where it came from. Come on, somebody, help me out here. I know, because I was a Christian just as long, if not longer than you. And for the longest time, I didn't know where it came from. I'm telling you, it comes from right here, Daniel chapter 9. So he says, for your people in your holy city. Now, all I'm trying to say is, is that if you, whenever we start looking at other scriptures, because once we're done with Daniel, we're going to dive right into Matthew 24. We're going to compare that to the seals. We're going to start talking about Matthew. Yeah, we're going to compare that to Matthew 24. Um, if we have time, I don't think we will tonight. I was going to show you one spot already in the book of Revelation chapter 6 that that allude to, and in my opinion, give great uh, evidence for more of a middle of the week pre-wrath rapture. Amen. And again, that's my opinion. Okay, but it's based upon scripture, all right? But I'm just trying to make a point. For strong believing pre-tribulational rapture believers, this is one of the reasons because they're saying that that last seven year period is specifically delineated for Israel. Does that make sense? Because of what was just said here. There's, there's, 70, there's 70 weeks, and we're about to break down 70 weeks, decreed for your people and your holy city and in that the last seven year, seven weeks or the last seven year period of that 70 weeks, we're about to break that down, is, is within that. And so that's why they're saying that, that la the last seven year period is for Israel. You understand what I'm getting at? At least that's their opinion. Now, if once we look at all the evidence, you think that that's strong enough to continue to, to, to bolster your your belief in a pre-tribulation rapture, then that that's fine. But I'm just giving you all the information. Now I'm trying not to look at it from any specific bias. I, you already know what I'm believing. Okay. All right. So what is the purpose of this 70 weeks to finish the transgression? Now, listen, there's a lot to all of this. Well, let's just try to make it quick. The transgression of what the transgression of the city. I told y'all last 
week that the Dome of the Rock is on the Temple Mount, this, the city of Jerusalem has been transgressed. Long before 600 AD when Mohammed's, not Mohammed because he was already dead, but whenever those caliphates and those generals of the Islamic nation took over the city of Jerusalem, long before that it was already transgressed because we've already talked about Whenever the Greek, you remember Alexander the Great? I know this is a lot of information, but y'all bear with me. When Alexander the Great defeated the Medo-Persian Empire and his kingdom was split in four. We've already talked about this. And out of the Seleucid Empire came Antiochus Epiphanes. And he, he put a pig on the altar. He caused them to quit, made, made them quit giving sacrifices. He transgressed the city. Then in AD 70, General Titus of the Roman Empire, what did he do? The Jews tried to fight back. This was after Jesus was already crucified. The Jews tried to fight back against General Titus and the Roman Empire. What did they do? They ransacked the city. They knocked down the, the temple. They raised it. Like they, they, they ran. I mean, it was level flat. So the city's been transgressed, and what some of these, some of this prophecy that the angel told Daniel is going, it, it had to do with when Jesus was going to come and 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 do his work now. But it also much of it has to do, some of it has to do with in the very end. Okay, so you're going to make an end to sin. I mean, Jesus, Jesus came and he offered his sacrifice for sin. Amen. But they're not sin has not been completely abolished yet. Right. And so, again, at the very end of this 70 week period, which is a certain time frame, is going to include the end of the seven year tribulation. Or I'm just calling it that the last seven, the last week. That's the battle of Armageddon. And Jesus is going to come back and be seated on the throne and he's going to start his millennial reign of Christ. And in sin, the enemy is going to be cast into a bottomless pit for a thousand years. That's what the Bible says, Revelation chapter 20. And so, and so, and, and then after that, he's going to be thrown into the lake of fire. And that's going to put an end to sin. Does that make sense? All right. To make atonement for iniquity. Jesus came and he made atonement for iniquity when he died on the cross. To bring in everlasting righteousness. Everlasting righteousness is Jesus. And, and, and that's when he comes to sit on the throne. So that's not completely, it's not, that isn't finally completed or fulfilled yet. To seal up vision and prophecy. Okay, that's not, we still have vision and prophecy. Because we're in the midst of the church age. And God is speaking to human beings. And he wants to reveal his truth. So, so vision and prophecy has not been sealed up. And finished with right and to anoint the most holy place now some scholars debate whether or not most holy place should be uh, whether the word place should be there as a matter of fact this is the NASB it's a literal translation but did you notice the difference between place and holy look right there on the on your screen mm -hmm. you, what is the difference between the, what with the word place it's, right? it's in italics that means that the translators are saying, ah, well, we want to put this word here, but it's not in the original Greek. I mean, I'm sorry, it's not in the original Hebrew, okay? But, but the context of the way that they're, and then listen, it would be the same way in another translation. When you see an italic, that means that the, that the word wasn't in the manuscript, but the context to them makes them feel very strongly that that word should be there. Okay, the King James does it too. All right, in certain places. Okay, but many people say that it could also mean the most holy. Yes, ma'am. It doesn't have the uh, word place in the King James. In the King James. Okay. And so, but at the same time, we could, list, list, but that's a good point. Let's go to that. And let's see. Most holy upon thy, let's see here. And anoint the most holy. But look at the word itself. Look at the word, the word itself. And I don't have my little pencil. If I had my pencil, I'd screenshot it and I'd open it up for you so you could read it with me. But this is what it says. A sacred place or thing. Okay. Uh, holiness. The, the a saint or the sanctuary. Okay. And, and so, the, the, so again, of God places, things, set apartness, set apartness 
So the meaning of the word that's used right there in the Hebrew can be translated as the sanctuary or the temple, or it could, and so scholars are divided. If you read behind them, some believe that it's talking about the final Ezekiel millennial temple, and then some people believe it's literally talking about Jesus. Okay, and so I'm just giving you, I'm just giving you, but that's a good point that, that you made. And that's, you know, typically I, use, I always use the NA as, I mean, the, the King James, but um, just to kind of like make the point there. So that was a good point. All right. So here we, here we go, verse 25. So you are to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince. So I'm not going to, well, I, you, if you're taking notes, then then you can write it down. Nehemiah chapter 2, starting in verse 1. And, I, and, and that's where the decree came. Okay, what is a, de what is a decree? So Daniel, Daniel is prophesying this probably somewhere around 500 to 480 BC. And then the decree to go back and rebuild the city came later. Came about 50 to 60 years later. Okay. And so Daniel prophesies it. Or the angel tells Daniel about it. Uh, and then and then later it actually happened. And when it happened. It's in Nehemiah chapter 2. Verse 1. Artaxerxes. And y'all might not remember. Nehemiah was the cupbearer. I mentioned it last week. I'm uh, teaching. I give a lot of information. But it's always repetitive. I'm very repetitive. So that it probably, hopefully it will sink in our brain. That Artaxerxes was the king of Persia. Nehemiah was a Jew that was in that was in Persia because of the Babylonian captivity that started way back with Nebuchadnezzar. He was the king cupbearer for the king, meaning that he had to make sure that no potions and poisons were put in the king's cup. And he had just received information from his brother in chapter one of Nehemiah that Jerusalem was ransacked, that it was a mess, that people were miserable. And then he walks into the king's presence with this long face. And the king says, what's wrong with you? You look like you're sick. I mean, I'm paraphrasing. And Nehemiah's like, of course I'm sick. I just heard about my hometown and it's all messed up. Would you, would you please have mercy? And so what the king does is he, he writes a decree to allow Nehemiah to go back and to begin rebuilding the wall. And, and, and in the end, they're rebuilding the streets, preparing the city. So that they could rebuild the temple, rebuild the altar, so that things could be restored in Jerusalem. Okay? So, but look, this prophet, this word from the angel took place before that. Does that make sense, what I'm trying to say? Y'all following me? I know it's a lot of information, man. But look, this angel says that from the time that the decree goes forth until Messiah. So, again, Jesus doesn't show up for another four, five hundred years. So this message that's coming from the angel is speaking to Daniel about future events that are ultimately going to end up talking about the last seven year period. All right. And so here we go to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah. So as soon as that decree goes forth or Ar Ar Artaxerxes, Nehemiah chapter two, verse one. When that decree went forth until Messiah was, it says that it would be seven weeks and 62 weeks. I'm going to go write it up here. Seven plus 62, right? Seven plus 62 is, is 69, okay? And, and so... What what we're so check this out. So what we're what what's being said here is is that whenever the king says you can go back and rebuild the city from that time until Jesus shows up, can we just go ahead and name the, who the Messiah is? Jesus. <laughs> and so when Jesus shows up and he and he dies, I, I told y'all this last week. Scholars state, and it's bigger than it's much more. I can't. I'm not that smart. They, they translate from a Jewish calendar to the Gregorian calendar, and they swear that they have the date that Artaxerxes gave this edict to go rebuild the city. And, and they, they compile that information to the time frame of 
when Jewish Jesus was when Jesus was rejected when he rode into town, and that it equals out to this sixty nine weeks. Okay, whatever, whatever that time frame is. All right. So so now what's interesting here is is that that leaves one week. Now, do you remember that last week we talked about, no pun intended, last week we talked about that the weeks weren't really weeks? Do y'all remember that? The weeks, of years. the weeks of years, right? What do we use? We use the word decade. They use the word heptad. A heptad is a seven-year period, but it's described, it was described as a week. And so it's a, it's a cut. So, so, here, so it's a total of 490 years. Okay, and 69 of them go from the time that, ne that Nehemiah got the edict until Jesus came. The last seven years is still lingering. Does that, does that make sense? The last seven years remain unaccounted for because it's 70 weeks. 70 weeks are determined upon your people. 70 times 7 it's 490 total years. Okay, this is 483 years. All right, does that help make it a little bit more sense? Because we're missing a seven-year period. 490 minus 7 is 483. There's a seven-year straggling period that is still unaccounted for. Now, the way I tried to describe it to you the last time is, is that the angel told Gabriel... From the going forth to rebuild the, the city until Messiah. So as soon as that edict went forth, it's almost like a, a, a um, it's almost like a time a stopwatch was going. Okay. So so Nehemiah walks into the king's court with his long face and Artaxerxes he says, "Why are you looking down? Here's the paperwork. Go rebuild the city." Boom. In the spiritual realm, in heaven, if you can say in the heavenly realm, boom, God starts a stopwatch. And that stopwatch starts running for this, for this total period until Messiah comes. Then Jesus comes, boom, the spiritual stopwatch is stopped because now we've entered into the church age. You understand? And so for these Thousands of years that we've been in the church age, the time clock has not restarted. And the time clock, what we're going to see is, restarts with the signing of a covenant. Many people believe, I have always believed and I was taught in the past, that the last seven year period starts with the rapture. It says right here that the last seven year period starts with the signing of this covenant. Alright, here we go. It will be built again. With plaza and moat, talking about the city, even in times of distress. Then after the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off. So there you go. That's describing the cross. Okay. And have nothing in the people of, of the prince. Look at this. This is the part where we're talking. This is the part where we're shifting gears. It was talking about Jesus, but now it's talking about the Antichrist. I got into a big old long discussion with the Jehovah's Witness fellow. A long, long time ago. He thought that this was talking still about Jesus. Look, the people of the prince who is to come. Now, I want you to understand this. I know that this stuff is complicated, but those of you that love end time stuff, you need to stay with me. The prince, the people of the prince who is to come. I'm just telling you, you got to trust me on this. The prince who is to come is the Antichrist. The people of the prince that is to come is the Roman Empire the first time. Okay, how do we know? Because it was established in history. Look, the people, let's just say this, the Roman Empire of the print, that's how we're connecting, that's how scholars have connected that the Antichrist will come out of a revitalized Roman Empire. All right, I, I know that I know we get deep, I feel like I'm losing, y'all. I'm doing my very, very best, I promise. The people, the Roman Empire, the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. There you go. How, how do you know? Because the city and the sanctuary were destroyed through General Titus in AD 70 of the Roman Empire. 
He, I, I just mentioned it. I'm mentioning it again. He came in. He destroyed the temple. He, listen, Antichrist ain't destroying the temple the second time. The, 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 no, no, no. He's going to be destroyed. The last time he's destroyed. Okay? So that's how we know that this is this prophecy here is intermingled with things that have happened in the history along with things that are going to come in the future. Does that make sense? So the prince... The people of the prince who is to come, and that's how we're connecting the Antichrist to the Roman Empire, who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary, and its end will come with a flood. Even to the end, there will be war. Desolations are determined. And now look, and he, who's he? The Antichrist. Antecedent back to that prince of the people that would destroy it. He will make a, how do we know this is the Antichrist? Because I'm going to tell you right now, when we get, get, continue to read this, Jesus has never done this. Jesus isn't a destroyer. Jesus is a giver of life. He will come back to destroy and judge when he comes back for Armageddon. But he didn't do that the first time. Look, he, talking about the Antichrist, will make a firm covenant. The King James says it like this. Let's see. And he shall confirm the covenant. People are divided over that. Does it mean that it was a covenant that was already signed that he reestablishes? You and I kind of talked about that the last time. I talked about the Balfour Declaration that was already written way back in the early 1900s. I talked about the Abrahamic Accord that Trump and Jared Kushner signed with those other those Arabian nations and that now supposedly Biden has reinstituted it. I don't believe that Biden's the Antichrist. I'm just trying to give you some things that have taken place in history so that you can understand what it might look like. That's all I'm trying to do right now. So this could be a covenant that's already in place that's reaffirmed. Okay. He shall confirm the covenant with many. That's talking about uh, talking about Israel because we're talking about Israel for one week. That's where that last seven year period is coming. I'm not making this up. This is people that are much smarter than have gone before me. Brother Swagger would, in his commentary, is going to say this. Okay. Many, he's going to make a covenant with many for one week. And look at this. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. This is so important. If you, but if you don't know the history, then, you, then this is just, it's just a bunch of Greek. It doesn't make any sense. Okay, but look. In the midst of the last week. Now, we were talking about We're missing a week. He's going to sign a covenant. And then the midst of that week, he's going to break the covenant. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close tonight with showing you some scriptures that I believe in the New Testament are directly correlating with this right here. But, but, but before we go to that, I want to remind you of something that I've already told you on more than one occasion. And I've even mentioned his name again tonight, Antiochus Epiphanes. The reason that it's important is because, Anti and I said, this, I said this a couple of weeks ago, Antiochus did this. He caused a desolation to the altar. That's what caused the Maccabean revolt. That's what caused... Hanukkah, the festival of the lights, also known as the feast of dedication that Jesus attended. That means Jesus understood that the Maccabean revolt happened. That means Jesus went to the festival because he understood it was part of his Jewish history. That means that he recognized it. And Jesus says in Matthew chapter 24 that... It's going to happen again. We're about to go to it. He says, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel, flee to the mountains. So what, so what I'm trying to tell you is, yes, it happened in history, but Jesus recognizes that it's going to happen again. Does, does that make sense what I'm trying to say? That's how we're breaking all this down. So in the middle of this last seven year period, he's going to do it all over again. This, this antichrist. He's going to cause the sacrifice and the, and the offering to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate even until the, the consummation or the finality. And that determined shall be poured upon the desolate some translations say upon the desolator in other words he's going to be destroyed that's basically what it's saying that he's going to be destroyed okay and that's the end of it all right 
So now I just want to show you a couple scriptures. And I've already showed you some of these before, and we're going to close with these. I know this is, uh, but let's, let's look at, I'll, I'll switch back over to the King James. Let's look at Matthew chapter uh, 24, um, verse 15. And we've already looked at this one, but look, this is Jesus talking now. Matthew 24. We're going to, as soon as we're done with the book of Daniel, we're going to dive into Matthew 24. All right, but look. When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation. Does that sound similar to something we just read in Daniel? Okay. Spoken of by Daniel the prophet. That's what he's talking about. Daniel chapter 9. Stand in the holy place. So I want you to, I want to slow down a second. So what Jesus is saying is, see, Antiochus did that too. Not only did he put a pick on the altar, but he also put an image of Zeus inside of the temple that looked like him and said, worship me. Okay, that's exactly what the Antichrist is going to do. He's going to elevate himself and say, worship me. Now, in order for all of this to happen, a temple has to be rebuilt. Okay, but look what Jesus is saying. When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation. In other words, when you see the Antichrist and you're going to know it's him because he's going to stand up and he's going to, he's going to make desolate the, the, the holy place. The prophets stand in the holy place. That's what Daniel the prophet said. That this, that this person that made this covenant and breaks it in the middle of the week, that's how he breaks it. He's going to reveal himself as the Antichrist and he's going to demand to be worshipped. When you see this happen in the holy place, whoso reads, let him understand. And then he goes on to say, let them which be in Judea flee to the mountains. We're not going to read that whole thing now, but we will get into it. Now, now look, I want, now I want you to see this in Revelation 13. And I've read this to you already before. But what I'm trying to, the point that I'm trying to make right now is all these scriptures that I'm going to, and I'm only going to go to about three or four more, are, are I believe, all representative of mid-week or mid-trib, since y'all are so since y'all are so used to hearing it that way, mid-trib, mid-week, that this is all going down. Like in other words, the Antichrist is. You know, nobody's gonna. You, we, you and I might know that it's him because of the fact that he signs this covenant and some weird stuff going on because of the fact that we have eyes. Hopefully, you know what I'm saying that we can see. But but in the middle of if, of the, if there if it is a mid-week, mid-trib, pre-wrath, rapture, and we're here because we're going to get into 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and it specifically states that the rapture can't happen till the man of sin is revealed. So we're going to have to deal with that. Okay, and when we get there, we're going to deal with it, my friend. All right, and that's, that's, that's a source of contention for me. Yes. So, so the, the point is, is this, is that is that in the middle is when he breaks it. In the midst of the last seven year period. And again the way that he believes he's going to break it is. Is because Jesus said it. He's going to stand up in the holy place. And he's going to say I'm God worshiping. Yes sir. Do you think we've seen before that happened in the previous sign? I, no, I, did, I did say that. And I do believe that people like us should be able to see that. I'm hoping. Yeah. Yeah. So. Sometimes the question is, and some people have even questioned, will we know for sure that a treaty was even signed? And I don't know. It just says that there's treaty signed. But I would, but I think personally, all of us, once we see this guy rise up, I, now he's going to be deceiving. Obviously, we'll also see them worshiping. Yeah, well, well, yeah. I, according to Second Thessalonians chapter two, we will see them worship him. As far as for him demanding to be worshipped. Now, that's, again, a, more of a mid-trib, pre-rat stance. Um, but, but I do believe that he'll be a person that will be, he's going to be so charismatic that the world is going to love him. And you, you understand what I'm saying? All right. So, so look, now we're, in math, now we're in Revelation 13, and, it's, and I'm just showing you, again, I believe that this whole chapter, in my opinion, is, mid, is more like mid-week, mid-trib, whatever you want to call it. They worship the dragon, which gave power unto the beast, and they worship the beast. The beast is the Antichrist. Okay. Saying, the, I don't mean to overwhelm you with a bunch of information, but I do again. <laughs> uh, the beast is a system and a person. Yes. 
okay? So it's, it's the whole system, the seven-headed system that's based on bad governments and false religion, but also in the end, a leader rises up in the midst of that system and he's the beast. He's the Antichrist. And so the dragon gives him power and just as God the Father receives worship through Jesus the Son, Satan wants to be worshipped the same way. Okay? Saying, who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? All right? There was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue 42 months. There you go. You remember how I told you that? Three and a half years. Okay? Um, and, and, then, and then the next uh, verse is uh, thir chapter 13, verses 11 through 12. This is the false prophet. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb. He spoke as a dragon. He exercised all the power of the first beast before him. And causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. What is my point to all of this? My point to this is I'm just showing you another scripture that says that the world is going to worship the beast. The world is going to worship the antichrist. Okay? Okay. This this particular scripture right here doesn't describe him being in the temple, but there's other scriptures like this one here. I want to show you. And look, this is one here, Second Thessalonians chapter two. We can we can go ahead and 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 take a look at this right here, verse three. And, and look, this is the Apostle Paul. This is one of the first things when we get to Second Thessalonians two. We're going to try to break it down even closer. But this is one of the scriptures that I believe. It, this is probably one of the biggest scriptures that calls into question the pre-tribulation right yeah. You ready? This is it right here. This is one of them right here. Let no man deceive you by any means. Now, you got to go back to verse 1. We don't have time to go back to verse 1. You can go read it tonight because he's talking about the rapture in verse 1. Let no man deceive you by any means for that day shall not come except there comes a falling away first. Now, People that take a pre-tribulation view or a pre-last seven year, pre-last week view say that that should have been translated as a rapture or a taking away. Yeah. But look at this. The word right here, you can't see it, but I want you to know. I'm going to tell you that word right there in the Greek is apostasia. That's where we get the word apostasy. That, is, that word has never been used to describe a rapture. So what he's actually saying is, is that, and if you, and I, I didn't plan on getting into all this, but what, if you were reading it as that was a rapture, you would say, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day the rapture shall not come except there comes a rapture first. <laughs> that's, what it's, that's what it would really yeah. be saying if that's what you were trying to say it was saying. Yep. But, what, but what I believe it's saying is, is that, that day, the rapture will not come until there come as a falling away first. Right. Now, the question is, some many people would say, well, there already is a falling away. And I agree with that. There's many of people in the church that have fallen away. But look at this. And that, so in other words, that day will not come until there's an apostasy of first and that man of sin be revealed. <laughs> Dude, that's a problem. So he's saying that the rapture is not going to happen until two things. Number one. A great falling away. Number two, the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. Who now, now I'm getting into the part that I really wanted to read to you. Who opposes and exalts himself. See there? He opposes God, he exalts himself. Above all that is called God or that is worshiped, so that he as God, look, sits in the temple of God, just like Jesus said he was going to do. When you see the abomination that causes desolation that was spoken of by the prophet Dan Daniel standing in the holy place, if you're in Judea, flee to the mountains. Here the apostle Paul through revelation of the Holy Spirit says that this man of sin is going to exalt himself in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So what I'm trying to get, get across to you, because this is the kind of stuff that I've been doing for the last seven years. I don't, I can't, my brain won't let me take one scripture. My brain says, oh, but we got to deal with all these scriptures. Yep. 
And all these scriptures that I'm trying to explain to you is, is that all this stuff is happening at the same time. Mid-tribulational. And we'll talk about that word tribulation when we get to Matthew 24. Or mid-week. That he signs the covenant that starts the time clock. In the middle of that last week, he actually exalts himself in the holy place. And he says, worship me as God. That's the, the he, it says it in the midst of the week, he basically, he's breaking the covenant. Okay. And, and he's showing himself to be God. All right. That's really all we have. Yeah. This covenant is signed. Who, who signed this? Well, it's, it's what the, the, the scripture saying is, is that he's, he, which is the prince that is to come, not Jesus, but the antichrist. Is signing it with many, and scholars describe that as being with the nation of Israel. Oh, with the nation yes. of Israel, yes. he's signing. Yes, he's covenant. signing a covenant with the nation of Israel, and it's bringing. The idea is, is that it's a peace accord, and that's why I used the the example of what Re President Trump and Jared did recently, only because it was all over the news, and it was. A, I'm not trying to say that's what it was. I'm just trying to make a point. That's the kind of like the idea. You remember everybody was like, Trump should get a Nobel Prize. Nobody has signed a peace agreement. Nobody's been, you know how many times they've tried to broker a peace deal? And I'm not saying that they've really established the peace yet. But what I'm saying is, you know how many times they went to the table with Yasser Arafat before he died and tried to sign a peace agreement? And, 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 they, and, they, and they would say that they were going to sign a peace agreement. And then, and then as soon as he got over there, he just wanted a, a publicity stunt. And then he would like say he wasn't going to sign it. So that was the point that I was trying to make when I said the thing about Trump and Jared. I'm not trying to say that that's it. I'm just trying to use that as an example that something has happened in history. And, and that's the kind of thing it's going to be. A peace agreement signed. With the, that's why anytime you hear a peace agreement signed with the nation of Israel, you're, yes, sir. And that was and that was and part of bigger, the Roman Empire. It's yeah. bigger than our Syria today. It's yeah. it's it's a big Yeah, the Assyrian Empire, the Assyrian yeah. Empire covered all that yeah. part yeah. of the map. Yeah. Turkey and Jewish for one. Yeah. And it comes from the old uh, yeah. lineage of the Syrians. Syria. Yeah. Possibly. I guess I guess not only I don't have any any problem because there is actually a scripture that calls him the Syrian. So I do know that there's okay. Um, and and again, the Syria Syria was a was a much bigger area back in those days, and it was part of the Roman Empire. Okay, when not before, but after Rome took over, they they okay. My only my only concern about the concept of and I could be wrong. Look, who am I? But my only concern about the concept that it has to be a Jew or else the Jews wouldn't sign it is, again, they just they just signed something with Trump. I mean, I guess we could say that it was because he brought his son-in-law with him. You see what I'm saying? Is that why they signed? Because they trusted Jared? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, yeah, they're going to be deceived. God's going to allow them to be deceived. Right. So that's the only... I, I don't have a problem with it. I get it that Jews want to trust another Jew, but but I just don't know that I want to hang my hat on that. That's all I'm trying to say. Does that make sense? I mean, Would they accept anyone that wasn't a Jew as their Messiah? Well, no, they're not going to accept anybody that wasn't a Jew as a Messiah, but he's not going to try to act like he's the Messiah when he first signs the covenant. That's not what I'm getting out of it. Did yeah. that okay. thing that Jared and the Trump signed with him, did that come before or after he moved the... Uh, I think it came after. after. You, the so capital. He was after that. He was. He showed that he was on his yeah. side. But he wasn't, but my point is, is that Trump wasn't a Jew. That's the, that's my only point to all that. They signed anything, it didn't happen, there was no peace. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So again, I'm just trying to make a point that to, and I know we gotta, we gotta move on, but we're having, this is good discussion. Is good. I don't have a problem <laughs> with the thought that Jews would rather trust another Jew. I get that. But again, do we have a scripture, and maybe we do, that I'm not aware of, 
that specifically says that Jews won't sign a covenant unless it's a Jew? Or is that kind of like, like an opinion that we might have formulated because we believe that Jews want to trust a Jew? You see what I, that's all I'm trying to get at. Yes, there is a scripture that calls him the seer. And I don't know where it is off the top of my head. But it, and it says something about him and not the desire of his people or something about it. Some, yes, exactly. it's in Daniel. It's it, we'll get that, to isn't it. Isn't that kind of inferred that he would be a Jew of his people? Yes, his, yeah, that, yeah. That's, the, that's, that, the that's probably the one that they're connecting to. But, but yes, yeah. And I mean, theoretically, they would, they would know. Um, I mean, again, that scripture... He doesn't have that scripture says he doesn't have a love for his people, but it, but it doesn't but it doesn't say I do understand what you're saying and that is in Daniel we will get to it, but it's not saying in that scripture that they definitely know he's a Jew. Again, I'm thinking from all kind of different angles because supposedly Hitler was part Jew and nobody knew it. Yeah, he was. You know, so nobody knew it at the time that I know of. Well, whether or not they're gonna know he's a Jew, I still believe he's gonna be. A Jew. Yes, but yes, and I'm okay they with that. Known, yes. Be yes. And, and I and I agree with that. So what, Jesus so did, he's got to have to yes. Yes. Right. yes. And I'm and I'm fine with that. I believe he'll be a Jew too. My only point is is that I don't know that Israel's going to know no, he's a Jew. Right. Okay. And I don't know that I want to stand so strongly on the thing that says they're not going to sign anything yes. unless it's with I don't a know Jew. They're going to know it. I just believe that. Yes. Scripture. Absolutely. Be, even yes. In some way it's I, I agree 100% with that. Yeah. yeah. Good stuff. Praise God. Let's pray. <laughs> Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your word, Lord. We thank you for the discussion. I thank you, Lord, that we have people in our church that love your word, that study your word, Lord, and that are knowledgeable, Lord. We just want to know the truth. We want to be prepared, Lord God. And so we pray that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear, Lord, and that you'd prepare our hearts, oh, Lord God, for the truth of the gospel, Lord, and that we would be able to navigate these end days, Lord, because we know something isn't right, Lord God, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs>